All right. Now that we're officially recording, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Latinx Task Force, and I have Jackie here with me also, the other co-chair. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I know you've already introduced yourselves and said hi already, but I do want to give the panelists a chance to introduce themselves. We've got Jasmine, Mercedes, and Karen here. Thank you to the three of you so much for being here, for being willing to share your story. I think that Jackie and I could sit here in front of a computer screen and talk about PAU all day, but it's really so meaningful to hear from your personal experience about how your time at PAU was, about what you've been up to since you graduated from our programs. So I don't wanna take up any more time um, and I'll let the three of you introduce yourselves. Uh, let us know what program you graduated from and we can go from there. Thank you so much. Uh, I can go first, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm Jasmine Yamas, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I graduated from the PhD clinical psychology program at Poly Pauline University. Um, my emphasis was diversity and community mental health. Um, Dr. Munoz was my <laughs> advisor. Um, so many of you know him. I also worked with um, Dr. Pineda, but it's nice to see everyone. I can go next. Um, oh, sorry, Karen. <laughs> um, my name is Mercedes Palacios. I similarly graduated from the PhD program in clinical psychology, and my emphasis was child and adolescent trauma, and I was in Dr. Patel's lab. Hi, my name is Karen Wilson. I was in the master's program in marriage and family therapy, um, and uh, yeah, Palo Alto University. All right, thank you again for being here. Um, so we can just move on to the next section. If I know we've talked about each of you kind of sharing your story, telling us what you've been up to since PAU. Um, so whoever wants to go first, go for it. I can go. Um, so I graduated about a year and a half ago from Palo Alto University, and I'm currently an intern in the state of Nevada. Um, I work as a safe school professional and in a charter elementary school, um, helping kids and their families navigate lives and things that they might be going through. Uh, the staff and I practice um, part time um, here in Nevada. The law allows me to do that. And so I am doing that at the moment. Um, I can go next. Um, so I graduated in 2022. Um, I am currently a postdoc fellow at San Mateo Medical Center um, within Integrated Behavioral Health. Um, we're in primary care. Um, so we work with um, low income, uninsured um, minority communities um, to provide short-term therapy treatment. So short BIs, total change from the 60 minute, it's 30 minutes and we get six sessions with them. Um, so it's been um, a really great experience there. I mostly provide services in Spanish um, and I also do a rotation at the pain management clinic as well there too. Um, and I'm currently working as a pediatric psychologist at Children's Hospital in Orange County, um, working in three different medical sort of clinics that we have there. Um, so some outpatient work, some inpatient work, and then part of the endocrinology um, clinic. So a little bit of everything within the hospital there. Um, I graduated from PAU um, in 2021. Um, yeah.
just to, did, did you all want us to just start our 15 minutes and just kind of spend more time in, in our, our past or do we want to just answer questions, questions individually? Would you prefer to uh, just talk about your experience and what has been helpful uh, for you or do you want us to ask the questions and just let whoever wants to answer, whatever you prefer. So we're thinking each of you can just talk about your experience uh, and then at the end we can ask questions. But yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So do you want us to just do our 15 minute beat? Like mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. Karen and, and Jasmine, do you guys have a preference or do you want me to just <laughs> you can start. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um just want to check in. Um so I will really briefly share some slides mainly because it helps me just stay organized. So I just created, um, let me share. Okay. Um, so I would just briefly, you know, I already introduced myself, but want to just share some of like the training background and how I kind of got to where I am now. Um, are you all able to see the slides okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, so before coming to PAU, I um, went to UCLA for my undergrad. I uh, got my BA in psychology. Um, I got my master's at Pepperdine University, and I also had an em uh, emphasis there in marriage and family therapy. Um, so I did get licensed as an MFT prior, prior to starting my PhD journey. Um, like I previously mentioned, I you know graduated with a clinical psychology PhD, uh, emphasis in child and adolescent trauma. I was in Dr. Patel's research lab, the cultural community and global uh, mental health lab. Um, a lot of my research there focused on immigrant, Latinx immigrant youth. Um, that's what I did my dissertation on, and that's an area in, in general in Latinx mental health that I'm really passionate about. Um, to share just some of my previous sort of practicum experiences, um, I was part of La Clinica Latina at Granowski Center my first year of training, um, then did a practicum at Kaiser um, in the Richmond Kaiser, uh, and then I was at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. Um, part of their behavioral emergency response team there. Um, I did my internship at Children's National Hospital in DC, uh, and then my postdoctoral fellowship at Children's Hospital of New York Presbyterian. Um, within a lot of my training experiences, I'll just share too, like what my thought process was as I was you know, choosing some of the training sites. And for me, I really wanted to gain as much as like varied experience as possible. Because I did come in with my MFT training, a lot of my previous training was in schools, um, doing home-based work. So when I was applying for positions um, through my PhD program, I was like, okay, what can I do that's different? So I really tried to prioritize being in different settings because I felt like that is what would help me maybe be more competitive. Um, and I also was exploring like, what do I like? Where do I wanna be? Do I wanna be outpatient? Do I wanna be um, you know, in an inpatient setting? When I worked at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, it was mainly in the emergency room. Um, so for me, I prioritized, let me do as many different things as possible and figure out what I like from there. Um, I ended up doing my uh, internship that was very PEDS heavy and very PEDS based. Um, so a lot of my rotations were um, within the hospital. I did some outpatient work. I worked at an inpatient um, unit for a few months and then got training in pain psychology and endocrinology. Um, primary care. Um, so it was a lot of different short rotations. Uh, I, when I was thinking about what where to go for internship, I also prioritized positions that could give me that ver variety of experience. Um, that way, by the time I was applying for postdoc, I would know what I would really like and um, uh, specialize in that a little bit more. Um, when I was in internship, I really loved being in the inpatient unit. I love learning DBT. I was really attracted to the acute care services. Um, so my postdoctoral fellowship, I prioritized acute care and trauma. Um, and that's where I got to really specialize more in DBT. I was part of a comprehensive DBT group um, and was able to also do that bilingually and prioritize settings that could give me that, where I was able to um, learn from supervisors that spoke Spanish and was able to kind of help with those services. Um, so that's a little bit about just my journey there. Um, something that I wanted to highlight too is just, um, I know one of our questions in terms of this talk was, you know, what helped you kind of get to where you're at now? And I would say for me, it, it was doing a lot of just extracurricular activities, doing beyond maybe what I was expected to, you know, to do. Um, so one thing that I always tried to do that PAU was really great at is 
pay attention to any announcements that were given or any like additional opportunities that came up. Um, I did a freedom camp, which that was something that PAU also advertised. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, it was with younger kiddos and it was um, getting exposure to um, how to treat selective mutism. Um, so that was one area where I don't specialize in like early childhood, but I was like, that might give me that experience of getting a sense of you know, what what in, that entails, getting used to a, a different diagnosis that I hadn't been exposed to as much. Um, another program that I was part of is the Paseo program, um, and that was a Spanish elective program in Peru, where I, it was just incredible, able to take a few classes in Spanish, able to do practicum positions there. Um, very short term, it was like about a month and a half. But similarly, you know, I learned about it through someone that previously had done it at PAU. So trying to take advantage of the pieces that I knew, you know, I would be interested in. Um, I did additional assessment opportunities within um, my, my practicum experiences just because some of the practicums that was it didn't have a lot of assessment. So I prioritized, okay, what am I missing? How do I fill some of those gaps? Um, because I had an MFT, I also did private practice. So that was really helpful. Um, and another piece where PAU is helpful is they have a lot of leadership opportunities or a lot of opportunities to work with others. So I was a clinic manager. Um, I took on TA positions. And I also look for leadership positions like within where I was at. I, I was lab manager. Um, I tried to join the different committee, committees. I was part of LTF, you know, while I was at PAU. Um, so I think just uh, my a, a big recommendation for me is like, look for things that you're passionate about. And a lot of the times that just build skills that will be really helpful to, you know, be able to accomplish or go where you want to go. Um, and then just a little bit more about where I'm at now. Um, again, I'm a pediatric psychologist at Chalk. Um, I am part of three different clinics. One of them is the medical coping clinic, and that's just short-term outpatient mental health services. We do diagnostic evaluations, various medical conditions um, throughout the hospital. And really we focus on, on adherence, pain management, adjustment, things that could be solved short-term or solved or worked on short-term. Um, and then if, if they need additional support, we help with um, connecting to um, additional referrals. Um, I'm also part of the endocrinology clinic. Um, where we do depression screeners for patients um, with diabetes diagnoses. And then I'm in, I'm involved of doing the risk assessment, evaluation. Uh, and then for kiddos that need additional support, I do see them short term from that, from those evaluations. Um, and then I'm also part of the pediatric consultation liaison service, um, where we get consults or pages from throughout the hospital and able to um, engage in uh, any sort of evaluation that might be needed. Some of the common ones that we do see are eating disorder evaluations, suicide evaluations, and then somatic um, symptom disorders. Um, so that's one of the pieces I do. And then just to end it with some of the tips and I've tried to throw it through, throughout as I describe my experiences, um, I would say one of the most important things is networking and, and really being sure to establish professional connections. Um, my recommendation would be to reach out to facu faculty members, mentors, you know, TAs, anyone that you might know might want to like, you know, get a closer connection with and be open to sharing your interests. A lot of the positions that I was able to get was really from sharing my interests with one person. And then some, when it ever it came up with someone else, they're like, hey, this, this person really likes this or um, sending me an email of, hey, this sounds like it'd be within your interest. Um, so I did that a lot where it's like, hey, let me share with other people with what I want to do. Um, and that's been really helpful. Um, and I would say do that in any position and no matter where you're at. Um, currently in my position, I don't do a lot of what I really love to do, which is more DBT work, acute care work. Um, and I've been sharing that where I'm at and we're working on creating a depression clinic. So I, I think that's a big thing for me where sometimes in the past I was just more quiet and didn't really talk as much about what I wanted to do. And I realized like how helpful that could be. Um, and I would say reaching out and emailing others that have similar interests. Um, and sometimes, you know, I think in PAU, it's really helpful because people know other people and other interests that they might have. So they might tell you, um, be able to guide you to where to go. Um, another big part is joining organizations, student groups, committees. Um, I was part of the NLPA committee while I was a student. Um, and try to join as many organizations or student groups as I could. And I think that that was really helpful exposure um, of like how to, you know, be part of a leadership organization. Um, but you also gain a lot of skills. 
one thing I noticed is a lot of like interview questions focus on, give me an example of working as a team. Give me an example of, you know, how you took on a leadership position. And if I hadn't done that, I, it wouldn't be as easy to come up with examples. And I noticed that that really stood out. Um, another big piece I would say is be brave. Um, push yourself to try new opportunities, even those that might scare you. And, and I put that for because for myself, I had a really hard time with presentations or speaking up or talking. Um, and as I took on TA opportunities, a lot of the times it's like, OK, well, do you want to give a guest lecture or do you want to, you know, run this certain thing? And I remember being really anxious and nervous about that. But I think it helped me build those skills and um, was so incredible. Another big piece is applying for scholarships, fellowships, anything that you might see. I feel like I got exposure to a lot of that through PAU announcements or um, things that other students had applied to. And a lot of the times I question like, well, I don't know if I'm qualified or I don't know if they would take it. Um, and sometimes I got it. So it was just really awesome to push yourself, um, even if, you know, it might seem scary in the moment. Um, and the other piece, being flexible and open-minded, I would say try new clinical experiences, age groups, settings. Um, like I said, I think sometimes I push myself to do things that I had never done before, um, just because I thought it would be helpful to get exposure. Maybe I like it, maybe I don't. Um, and at this point in training, you're still getting supervision. So it's the best time to try new clinical opportunities. Um, and that's a big piece of how I got my job currently. I did a endocrinology rotation on internship. And I think that that's what made me competitive to get the position I have now. Um, and it's not something that I, I feel like prior to doing it, I would think, oh, I'd be good at this, or I know how to do this. And luckily being trained in it, you know, opened a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't think would be possible. Um, and then again, keeping an eye out for postings. Um, and then the really last piece is self-care, building a strong support network. Um, I, I can't imagine having gone through all the experiences without, you know, having friends or mentors and um, people to help me along the way. Also having good boundaries. I mentioned doing a lot and sometimes I'm like, okay, <laughs> take a step back and not do as many things. So prioritizing what feels good for you. Very lastly, self-compassion. I think that this career path is can be really hard. We end up applying to so many things and obviously there's only a certain number of positions, internship process so difficult, um, but having compassion of, you know, being open to applying to places at the same time, knowing that it's a hard thing, you know, when you might not get a position and, and here I'm talking about the positions I got, but I applied to so many things that I did not get. So I think uh, keeping that in mind, right? Like how do you take care of yourself as you're in this journey of this career that Put, puts you in that position to potentially apply to things that you might not get. Um, and I think that sometimes that's not always talked about. So I wanted to just make sure to bring that up and um, yeah, just having that support network for yourself. So that's hopefully my 15 minutes and we'll take questions at the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mercedes. Um, we will, yeah, we'll go to questions uh, at the end. Uh, Karen or Jasmine, do you want to go next? Yeah, I could go. Um, so I don't have a presentation, but I do kind of have a little bit of my backstory and kind of um, how PAU has, it was really a great experience, especially um, I ended up going into PAU prior to COVID and past my first semester, COVID happened. And I got to say, having PAU just guide you through um, through COVID while being a intern um, or while being a student was very, very helpful. And it really, really did prepare me for telehealth and being able to kind of come into this new world of um, post COVID um, and be able to have clients either online or in person and just help them out. So I think, that's one of the best things that I got from PAU is that through such a hard time, um, all my professors, all the staff were able to support us in the transition that um, if you guys remember, it was, it was nuts. It was crazy. Um, so having that experience was so much easier once I graduated to go into the world of post COVID and being able to provide services to um, to my community through different ways that made them feel safe and made me feel safe. Um, 
But one of the things for me is that, um, so I graduated with my master's in marriage and family therapy about a year and a half ago and transitioned to uh, Nevada, where I actually decided to, in, rather than go into a agency, I decided to go ahead and open up my private practice. Um, because one of my goals in life was to live a simple, gentle life. And I think oftentimes we're just for the hustle, right? Like, especially for me being Latina, we're like, gotta work. Um, but I really wanted to kind of switch my mindset into um, providing services for my community in a way that makes me feel the best um, and that was able to help others. And so um, opening up my private practice was helpful. And um, I was contracted as a school safety school professional, which accumulates hours for my internship. Um, Nevada is called an internship rather than an associateship. Um, and so I'm still working through the process. I have a year left to be able to go ahead and um, become fully licensed. And this way it allows me to be able to still work in a school setting and get my hours and then be very, very selective about my time and energy uh, in my private practice. So a lot of the time I do pro bono or um, low income, um, being a Spanish speaking in Las Vegas, it's a huge Latino community. So I do have like pro bono hours or um, be able to provide low, um, low cost services through my private practice. Um, and um, Again, PAU was just very supportive in the transition. So it helped me actually be able to reach more people through doing telehealth, uh, being able to advertise um, services. And I guess one of the things that if people, if you guys or anyone plans to go into a private practice, I would say kind of switch a little bit more into the business mindset. Um, because oftentimes you have to take care of yourself first, either financially, time-wise, boundaries, all that kind of stuff, in order to be able to provide the services that you do want to provide. Um, with that in mind, make sure to remember that you're still human. Um, I think oftentimes we forget that we're also human and we also have human needs. Um, and we just give, 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 right? Because that's what comes out of our hearts. Um, but oftentimes you really do have to take a step back and just um, ask for support, you know, connect with your colleagues, connect with your friends, um, have a good time. And, um, and also like find the mentors that really, really support not only the work that you do, but the spiritual side of who you are. Um, because I think oftentimes, at least for me, um, we put that in the back set where we just kind of forget that we are human, that we are like spiritual beings or we are very uh, connected beings. And so having someone, a mentor or a supervisor or a group of colleagues that really support you in that um, can be very healing and can be very supportive. Um, but um, again, uh, PAU was very helpful, especially in my internship, because I was able to work with a var variety of people. Um, being able to use my Spanish was very helpful um, because I did not use my Spanish for a very, very long time. And so coming back into a Hispanic community or Latino community and being able to use my Spanish was very, very helpful. Um, I'm not sure if you guys still have a class in Spanish speaking for clinicians. I know you guys were working on that. So if anyone that does speak Spanish or wants to learn how to speak Spanish or wants to be able to provide, uh, provide uh, services in Spanish, I would suggest kind of going into that. Um, and just really um, forgiving yourself also in the fact that like, at least for me, I'm not perfect in Spanish. And um, it's really fun when your clients help you out to like speak Spanish and you help them out in the English words and it just creates such a beautiful connection. Um, so just don't be afraid to fail in the things that you don't know, because um, one thing that I learned from working with clients is that the connection is the most important thing. And when you fail, they'll pick you back up. And when they, they fail, you'll pick them back up. And it's just wonderful. So work on your Spanish, but don't be afraid to fail. And um, just be extremely selective of where you put your time and energy. Um, you are a resource that um, has limited hours. So just 
make sure that you select the life that you want and that you are putting the hours that you want to put in uh, and also protect your energy and protect your time and protect your emotional being because it is a very stressful field. Um, and oftentimes because of the field that we're into, what draws us into this is that we are very caring, that we want to help. Um, and we should never be in the back burner because if we can't take care of ourselves, we won't be able to take care of our clients. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, Jasmine, do you want to go? Yes. Um, so once again, my name is Jasmine Yamas, um, and my emphasis at PAU was diversity and community mental health. Um, I was part of Dr. Munoz's lab, I for Health, and worked with him and Blanca. Um, I was able to get a lot of opportunities working in his lab, so that is just a little pivot of a tip organization to really work with um, your lab. Um, they're your support, and they're able to help you look for different opportunities in either research or training. Um, just got to talk to them. And so currently, I am working as a postdoc at um, San Mateo Medical Center. Um, I've actually stayed on for two years now. Um, I really enjoy the work that I do there. It's a primary care setting, and it's mostly with um, uninsured, low SES, uh, mostly immigrant um, communities. Um, majority of the patients seen there are do have a Latino background, um, but there are a lot of communities from different um, cultural and ethnic and uh, religious backgrounds that we serve there too. Um, since um, it's a county hospital, it's a safety net hospital. So actually San Mateo Medical Center has their own um, insurance. And so the individuals who don't have insurance, they pay for them to have like the basic medical needs. And it also covers uh, therapy. Um, so most individuals, this is their only chance to get therapy because other insurances won't accept them. Um, so it's really great. And we get to work with a lot of diverse communities. Um, even though my emphasis was in diversity and community mental health, there's so much trauma. And that's something that I, you know, was not that shocked, but not like fully aware that that was going to be majority of the work being done there. Um, but it's really lovely. We get to work with the primary care doctors. Um, we're really um, respected and valued on the team. So our offices are actually within the primary care. And so we have rotations where the primary care doctors can call us. Uh, it's kind of like a warm handoff line. So if they have a patient that they're currently seeing and they're ex uh, expressing like suicidality or depressive anxiety or other mental health symptoms, they just give us a call and then we can come into the exam room and talk with them and offer our services. Um, so it's a really great program. I really love working there. Um, majority of the patients that I do see are Spanish speaking. Um, and I also work at the pain, the chronic pain clinic there too. Um, so I'm able also to provide um, treatment for different types of chronic pain, help run groups, assessments, all of that stuff. Um, and then also I get to learn different types of treatment modalities while working in this care. Um, our team of psychologists are really well-versed and um, strengthening skills in biofeedback and hypnosis. So this is all really cool stuff. Um, and so now to talk about my experiences at PAU. Um, so I, um, I was part of Clinica Latina for, you know, the first year practicum. My supervisor was Dr. Revilla. It was really great being able to work with her. Receiving Spanish supervision in Spanish was so helpful and so enriching in the uh, training process, especially since this was the area that I really wanted, you know, help in to develop in because we're learning all of these different skills and techniques in English. Um, and if we don't have someone to practice in Spanish, it's really hard to strengthen those skills. And so I really appreciated, you know, my time with Dr. Revilla. I learned so much from you. Um, and it was just a really great experience. Um, and then I also did another practicum at Marin County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services. It was Latino Family Health. So it was outpatient severe mental illness. 
um, I was trying to look for opportunities that would help me continue to strengthen my, my language skills in Spanish to provide treatment and also to work with uh, Latinx communities. Um, I also ended up doing a, another practicum at UCSF Zuckerberg um, SF General Hospital um, for developmental and assessment and intervention. So mostly with uh, kiddos suspected of developmental delays. So a lot of um, autism assessments and other types of assessments. And then I ended up doing my internship at um, Pacific Clinics, um, which is an adult, an adult outpatient um, clinic for individuals experiencing severe mental illness. Um, and so that was right in the kind of the height of the pandemic. And so it was really interesting to learn how to provide, you know, telehealth services to individuals who have difficulty um, trying to navigate the system and who are also experiencing severe mental illness. So it was it was kind of tough, um, but luckily had a lot of support and then a lot of consultations, you know, with different um, mentors really helped throughout that process. Um, and then that led me to start my uh, journey with San Mateo Medical Center. Um, ended up doing um, another like internship year there, and then ended up um, staying on as a postdoc um, uh, there and just the different opportunities that I named earlier. And so some of the different experiences at PAU that really helped me become competitive for the field that I wanted to be um, was just trying to join different leadership opportunities, just how like Mercedes was saying before, trying to be involved in different organizations, different committees, um, you know, I was part of LTF when it first started as well. Um, also co-president with Mercedes and Pulso. I was also part of the student council as treasurer. Um, so just trying to take on as many leadership opportunities as I can um, to help me learn skills that will help me become a well-rounded clinical psychologist. Um, and then also just joining the different, you know, opportunities and like happy hours and, you know, student orgs, uh, whatever, you know, I can't think of the word right now, like get togethers that they would host, um, just to help connect with the students, because we have so much work to do, um, so little time, and just being able to step out and to just interact with our other, you know, student, you know, colleagues, cohorts, it's really great. Um, and another tip too is just to like really build those study groups. I know for me, having a strong study group, having a strong like friend and support group is what really helped me navigate this whole, you know, education process, you know, booking a couple rooms in the library and then coming in on the weekends to study together. Um, that was really helpful. And also just networking, being able to talk with, you know, the the students who are in later years, asking them what opportunities they did, um, networking, just talking around, expressing interests. Um, that's all really helped me stay connected to the different opportunities that I was able to participate in. Um, and also just talking to your advisors, um, talking to the people in your group. If you're interested in like helping out in a research study um, or if you're wanting publications, um, talking to them, learning how to be able to do that for yourself. It's all was really, really helpful. And also just asking for help too. Uh, I know life happens and sometimes we need like a pause or a break or like a, a like a problem solving, you know, session with our advisors or professors um, for when those things happen. Because, you know, how's Karen was saying, we're, we're people, <laughs> we're not robots, <laughs> we have needs, and it's really important to advocate for our needs at times, um, because sometimes we feel like we need to just go, 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 um, but we also need to take a moment to pause and to reflect about our own needs, too. Um, but yeah, I think it's just what everyone else was saying, um, just be able to Keep trying, keep pushing yourself, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, I know it's really hard to like fail or to not succeed, 
Um, but these are the times when we can do that because we have the support to help guide us and to help us learn from these different situations and experiences. But yeah, just just keep trying. Y, y todo se puede con tiempo. Thank you, everybody. I think you are um you are, you have very different positions, and it was great to hear how you are serving different populations, how you got where you are, and how you are like dealing with different challenges. Uh, so we are going to open it up to everybody. If you have questions, this is a great time to ask either a specific panelist or just to everybody, and uh, they can they can answer if they have an answer to your question. I don't have a question, but I, I just have a comment. I just wanted to let Mercedes know. Mercedes, you were involved in writing the Hispanic Serving Institution um, uh, initial uh, study as to how that was that would happen and all of that. I don't know if you know, but now we are an HSI. We got it, right? So your work, uh, your work paid off. I mean, it took a long time for it to happen, <laughs> but it happened. So sometimes these things you do, as, as as you and Jasmine and Karen have been saying, you know, you you gotta get in there and and do stuff. I mean, if you see there's something missing in your institution, something that's not happening, start getting it to happen. And you know, you're not gonna win every battle. <laughs> it does, you know, it doesn't work that way, but. Uh, you win enough uh, that it, you know if you try I don't know ten things you know maybe three will work but that's three things that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't done it so so uh, again congratulations Mercedes that your work there actually paid out we now are an HSI a Hispanic serving institution so thank you thank you for mentioning that that that's incredible I know when I heard about it I was so happy and and just amazing to see that too and. And yeah, when we started, it was just research. I'm like, who has HSI? How do we get it? You know, it was like asking yeah. those first questions. And yeah, it's incredible. I have a, a question for Jasmine. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I um, mentioned in the chat, but once again, um, Jasmine, what do you have? What are your kind of plans for um, after postdoc? So, I'm hoping to stay on <laughs> at San Mateo Medical Center. Um, just seeing, you know, if things will end up working out in that way. But um, I really like working in primary care, especially with like the communities that we work with. Especially since, you know, I I literally this is the first time that I I don't remember all of my patients. I have like maybe. 40, 40, 50 patients that I have on my caseload right now. And it's because like, there's no one else I can see them, right? And it's, uh, right now it's two other individuals who speak Spanish and we can provide those services. So our caseloads are a little bit higher just because there's a higher need, um, but really hoping to stay there. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Buena suerte. <laughs> yep, good luck. You all look so young. <laughs> so, so young. It's kind of crazy to think that you, all the work that you guys are doing. So proud of you guys. And, and you're each doing different, you know, the, uh, different areas. I mean, Karen, you know, is private practice and uh, Jasmine in a, in a public sector hospital and so on. So it's... Uh, it's good to know that there are a lot of possibilities and uh, thinking about what fits your own life goals best is important. Karen, I have a question for you. So I, I, I'm wondering where you did practicum. I don't remember if you answered that. And then how was the transition like from that, from practicum to private practice? Um, so I did my practicum at Aki Asian American for Community Services, I believe, or something like that. Um, and so I worked mostly with adults and older adults and provided also case management uh, through there. Um, going into, I always knew that I wanted to go into, um, into my own private practice or opening up my own agency. 
Um, so when I went into that agency, I was able to see kind of the structure that they created. Um, they were able to have policies and procedures that really made sense to me. And so I grabbed a lot of the information and the way they manage things and use that um, to be able to restructure my own private practice. Um, and again, it's only my own private practice at this moment. So it's just me, but a lot of the things that uh, they did and a lot of the things that um, how they manage uh, case management or anything like that was extremely helpful um, on my side. So I knew that they had like, um, accountants that they went to. So I made sure to get my own accountant. I knew that they had people that you could go to for questions. So I made sure to create myself a uh, network of people that I could go and ask a question to. Um, so again, it was, it was different because although I went in um, to do my practicum and provide services, I did um, ask those like business questions. I did uh, look into their policies and procedures um, and I did try to grab a lot of their information and restructure it for what fit for me. Thank you for sharing on that. I know, yeah. I think Chloe has a question or a comment. Hi everyone, um, my name is Chloe Corcoran. Sorry, I am not exactly camera ready this afternoon. Um, I am the Director of Alumni Relations here at PAU. It's a relatively new position. I've been here about a year. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here. I was taking notes throughout your presentation about the importance of networking and the business mindset and all of those things, because that's what we want to provide to everyone. So if I can ever be of help, please feel free to reach out. But thank you so much. These things are so important and I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. You see Myra's uh, question in the chat? Okay, so I'll read the, the comment and the question. Uh, thank you for mo so much for sharing. I will be completing my undergrad this spring and plan to take a year off to gain some clinical experience and then apply to PAU. Do you have any general advice for me? Uh, Myra, before they answer, which program are you thinking of applying to? Hello, hi. Um, I'm thinking about applying to the PsyD program. Mm. So I can give some advice um, to you, Maya, just depending on like what you were able to do um, during your undergrad experience. Um, I completed my undergrad at UCSC um, with the clinical, not clinical psych, uh, general psych um, and minor education. But I didn't. Uh, I was able to get some research experience, but not too much. And so what I did is, before applying to uh, PAU, I took a couple of months off um, after graduation, and then I just uh, applied for different assessment and research opportunities. And so I was able to do that, um, and I was able to just get some more like uh, assessment and research experience for another like seven, eight months. And then I decided to apply to PAU. Um, so just seeing like what you think might help you, you know, build your CV, get you some more, you know, well-rounded experience to help you be more competitive when applying. Um, so just keep in mind that. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And also I was wondering if, um, if any of you would be open to maybe sharing your emails and um, I would love to contact you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. you Sorry, if you want to put your emails on the chat, you can you can do that. Definitely can add our emails. Um, one other thing I was going to share. Similarly, after my BA, I also took some time off to sort of get more clinical experience, but also just figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I ended up doing um, ABA therapy. Um, which I felt like was closely aligned to psychology and a lot of the, you know, pieces that I had learned. So I did that for about two years and um, really enjoyed that and was, um, you know, a really helpful learning opportunity. Um, and 
because I hadn't decided exactly what type of degree I wanted to pursue in terms of the doctorate level, that is actually why I did my master's first. I was like, you know what? Like, I know I want to do psychology. I think that at least I can start doing this. Um, some of the programs I had looked into as well required a master. So I was like, I can't go wrong doing this. Um, so that's why I pursued the master's level first, did an MFT. Um, then I worked for another two years before I, I started the PhD program. So that was another way of, of me of like really getting more um, experience, clinical experience, and just getting a, a better sense of the field overall. Um, of course, it made it the journey a little longer, um, but that's that's kind of the path that I took as I figured out what I wanted to do as well. Myra, one, one other bit of advice. Uh, if you are, are planning on applying to this ID program, you might want to look into the faculty who are there, what areas they are interested in, um, and uh, see if you could find uh, you know some experience that's related to those areas um, to document the fact that you really are interested in those areas. Uh, just in general, uh, you know, in your career planning for at any level in your career, just saying that you're interested in something doesn't count as much as actually having done something in that area, showing that you really mean it, right? So if you say, you know, well, yeah, I'm interested in serving low-income people, but you've never worked with low-income people, it, it just doesn't have the same impact as if you can say, well, I spent this time volunteering here and this time doing something here. You know, that, that just makes your, your application so much stronger. Right, thank you so much, Ricardo. That's really, that's very sound advice and it's great, thank you. I also had a question um, as I'm navigating practicum sites and taking into practicum sites that do offer a Latinx emphasis or um, working with a Spanish speaking population. Um, but then I noticed that sometimes, like, even though I'm pretty comfortable speaking Spanish, I do notice that my ability to provide intervention in Spanish is at a different level than my ability to provide intervention in English. And feeling the gap, um, there's a lot of, like, things that I, like, try to process, like, because I am doing my best, but I do feel like um, in order to be competent in Spanish, there's a little bit more undertaking I have to do on my own like listening to audiobooks in Spanish, trying to practice reading in Spanish, which by the way is very hard. Um, and just like all this, like, it, yeah, it is extra stuff, but it's extra stuff that I wanna do because I wanna serve the population in a way that feels okay. Um, but then, but then, you know, when you set aside extra time to do this, it, it, time is an infinite, it comes at a cost of something else. Um, and so then I also grapple with like, well, I'm I'm really happy. I'm putting this time toward developing my Spanish skills. And then sometimes I'm like, but what about my English skills? What about the other population that I'm trying to serve? Because it's not 100% one way, 100% the other way. Um, so in your experiences of trying to build your competencies to both treat Spanish and English populations, how do you navigate that a bit? Um, I always say, give yourself grace. Again, we're not perfect. And, um, I think, I think if you would put yourself in the position of your clients, would you expect them to have perfect English or to have perfect Spanish or to really, um, you know, I think oftentimes it is kind of, uh, know where your limits are and just give yourself grace and know that just because you do have a limit, um, it doesn't make you a bad clinician. It doesn't make you um, any lesser. It just means that there's room for growth. But again, give yourself grace because it's not easy. And you just take it one step at a time. And you know, um, you work with your clients to the best of your abilities. And um, you just do the best you can. And you know, you, you give yourself grace. Also, I would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Mias. No, no, no. You, you are the guests. You go first. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say. I mean, very similarly, right? And I, and I do feel like that is uh, such an important conversation because, in a lot of ways, as Spanish providers, we do do a lot more work. We're asked to translate things. We're asked to 
do things that maybe other colleagues don't do. And I feel like that is the part too where we could be brave and start advocating for what you need, right? So like it probably takes you, I don't know, a little bit longer to prep for sessions if you have to translate in Spanish. So maybe communicating that to your site and saying, I need an additional hour because I'm going to be doing this. Um, I'm learning how to do that now as a, a an employee too, where it's like, hey, I need some dedicated time to do this if this is an expectation for, of me. Um, and I 100% acknowledge the power differential because I know that it's a hard thing to ask. And it took me years to get to this level to be comfortable with like, hey, this is not fair. Like I need something to change. Um, but I think it's so valuable for all, all of us to like continue to build that skill and ask for fair treatment, right? A lot of the times we don't get paid extra for the work that we do. We don't get like a, a stipend for being bilingual or you know anything like that. So I think it's important to, to ask for what you need and maybe maybe even keep track of the time that you're taking, right? That um, it is helpful for, for people to know and for the agencies to know and um, all of those pieces. I think it's important. That's absolutely true. I, I just what, one a, a vignette when I was uh, when I first started as a psychologist at San Francisco General Hospital, I was 27 years old, and uh, I, um, you know, it's a public sector hospital again, helping very low income people. A lot of Spanish speakers because we're in the Mission District, which was the Latino barrio back in <laughs> back then. Um, and I, so I would uh, volunteer to, you know, go translate for patients throughout the hospital. And people learned, oh, there's this Spanish-speaking psychologist there, you know, so they would ask me to come. So I, I, I would do that. And my boss, the chief psychologist there, took me to his office one time and said, Ricardo, I want to thank you very much for all the translation you're doing, but stop it. Because you are contributing to the hospital not having Spanish-speaking services for our patients. Right. I mean, so you go and do it and then they don't have to hire a Spanish speaking professional uh, in their department. You know, we got to do that. And uh, that was uh, that was a good learning experience here. I was, you know, I was doing something I thought was generous. And in fact, I was inadvertently uh, adding to the problem, <laughs> you know. So I think you, you got to be careful. I think what Mercedes is saying, you know, you, you got to ask for fairness. I mean, we do have to do a hell of a lot more work than bilingual therapists, uh, partly because, it, you know, all the translation and so on, you know. Also, learn to find Spanish language materials. We have a lot of them available in our website. Um, you can download them uh, at, at no charge um, for, you know, treatment uh, in, in, uh, in Spanish for depression and other kinds of things. Find the Spanish-speaking materials so you don't have to translate them all from the beginning. and then. Uh, Put yourself into situations where you have to use the the, the language. I, I remember I had a a an, an intern uh, and a postdoc who was a Chicano from East LA. He didn't speak Spanish very well, and but he would come in. He would have his yellow pad and he would come in having written out what he wanted to say in the sessions in his yellow pad, so he could say it fluently. You know, he worked with me for two years. He was from uh, his family was from Guadalajara. And he went to visit his family before he started working with us and after the two years. And his relatives told him he had improved his Spanish tremendously in those two years. So you got to get in there and, and put yourself in the situation and you learn it. You learn it. Thank you. That was reassuring. I Spanish is my first language and I worked as a medical interpreter and I worked a job that compensated me for being bilingual before. Um, but it's still not easy at all. Uh, so it's it's interesting to know, like, you know, some several years in, it's still a learning process. Yes. I just need to say that I'm so, so proud. Um, of course, uh, Karen, it's, it's great to, to meet you and to see you and and I'm so proud of uh, Mercedes and Jasmine. Um, where are they now? And I know how much they really were so, so, so hard, but it's so good that at the end, they are really um, doing what they want to do. They are being a value and appreciated and uh, they are so nice and healthy and it's beautiful. So, and Dr. Munoz, you know, remember that we have 6% of, um, 
psychologists that are, um, you know, bilingual and serving. But now I think PAU is helping to maybe increase that number. And I'm really, really proud and excited. And oh my gosh, so good to see. Um, and thank you, Mercedes and Jasmine, for for the presentation, and of course, Karen. Your also, experience. Bien, orgullosa. Um, the best of luck. Yes. <laughs> Good. Thank Gracias you. for ayudar resolver los problemas que existen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And and I think that that's another you know highlight of why I even went to PAU. Right, having Clinica Latina, having like this emphasis on wanting to do this work, and and all of you for all your help and support and can't imagine have done all this without all of the, the mentorship and support from you all as well. So, so, so happy to see LTF growing and continuing to do amazing things. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your experiences and for taking the time to, to prepare for this. And thank you everybody else for being here. And uh, and yeah, so we will send you an email when we have the, the video on the website so you can all access it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.